on the stage for opening remarks, the former president of Estonia, distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, United States, Thomas Henrik Ilves, please. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Ambassador, uh, I'm generally happy to be here at the uh, Open Estonia Conference, not merely because I have been a supporter of this fundamentally important, right, thank you, uh, organiz uh, organization since its founding, nor even because Estonian government trolls call me a Soros fascist. Um, I'm not kidding. But rather, I'm happy because throughout the years, Open Estonia has focused on and promoted the fundamental idea, idea as a society striving to become more open, to achieve that goal of free and fair elections, rule of law, and respect for human rights that has been the apotheosis as well as the Ursprung of all successful societies. But I'm not going to talk about the Berlin Wall today, or I would recommend everyone read uh, one of the best articles I've seen uh, by the, on the whole issue, a personal reminiscence by a woman named Constanze Stelzenmüller, who was at the uh, Brookings Institution in Washington, but is German, but simply stunning essay. And it's called German Lessons, Elements of an Education. And if you look at Brookings, you can find it. And that's my promo for my good friend, Constanze. But as we survey open societies across the world since the heady days of 1989-91, we can help but observe, as Freedom House annually documents, not an increase, but rather a steady decline in the number of democracies in the world. Once open societies across the democratic world, some so-called new, some others old established ones, are one by one turning toward what they themselves occasionally proudly proclaim as illiberal democracy, which is characterized by restrictions on freedom, by corruption, arbitrariness, and sometimes even by fear and repressions of the sort we in the formerly communist East strive so hard to leave behind us. The various putative causes for this have been weighed and discussed enough and to little avail. Globalism, the revolt of the ones left behind, the failure of the elites, etc. I find many of these uh, etiologies lacking, especially those reasons most often raised in discussions in Eastern Europe, the so-called losers uh, in the success story of the past 30 years. That is to say, we had all these reforms, but we didn't pay enough attention to the people who didn't succeed with the reforms. Uh, this is the wrong framing, and the argument ignores real data. It takes but a look at the Gini coefficient in these countries, and I speak of Eastern Europe, that is the measure of inequality, that is how unequal society is, and this is, there is a coefficient that computes this. And we see, if we look at the Gini coefficients in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and say compare them to the Gini coefficients, the coefficient of the United States, we realize this is utter nonsense. No matter how much hand-wringing politicians and pundits have thought about the issue of the left behinds and so forth, it's, it's the case that be it uh, here in Estonia or in the UK or in Germany or in Poland, uh, that we actually do not have a problem of people be, being left out of the economic boom. And in fact, one of the, co the countries with one of the lowest Gini coefficients at all in the world is Hungary. 
So why don't we get, like, get rid of this hand-wringing and look at other factors. In fact, income inequality across the EU has been declining. Across the board in the EU, it is much lower than, say, in the U.S., where it has been high and rising, especially under the current populist administration. There is no absence of populists in the countries with, as I mentioned, the lowest income differential coefficients, Hungary. On the other hand, where the Gini coefficient is high, we need not see, the pop see populism in power. What we do see across countries, regardless of the factual inequality, is the exploitation of emotions against the other, whatever that other is, either foreigners or immigrants, or the domestic other, what is called, what people call the elite. Be it in the US, the UK, Hungary, where populists are in power or among significant opposition parties such as Italy's Liga Nord, Germany's AfD, the Swedish Democrats and France's Front National, xenophobia has become a major trend among democracies. In some cases, as in Hungary or here in Estonia, two of the most ethnically homogeneous countries in Europe, these foreigners are simply imagined. Politicians rage against them, yet they are not present in any noticeable number in this country. However, as a result of the few who are in these countries, or as a, as a result, sorry, I read this wrong, the, of the, as a result of this kind of demonization, the few that are present here who may look a little different are subject to harassment, sanctioned by hateful rhetoric by people in power, which we know well in this country. Um, but more interesting to me, since it is present in all populous uh, countries, is hatred of the so-called elite, one's own compatriots, people who share the culture and look like us. The most evident case of this is in, we see in Washington today, where in the name of draining the swamp of the elite, the Trump administration has created the greatest case of self-dealing corruption of the civil and foreign service and wealth accumulation by the, the really rich elites that the U.S. has seen in the last 120 years. I mean, perhaps during the Gilded Age it was like this. Um, there are two components to this elite issue. Uh, one proposed and the other described by German thinker. The first comes from Carl Schmitt, a legal scholar and generally considered the smartest Nazi, who proposed an alternative definition of lib for liberal democracy. Whereas politics in democracies strives for compromise and for common solutions, Schmidt, in his The Concept of the Political or Der Begriff des Politischen, in the original, argued that the goal of politics is the destruction of the other ones, where political opponents are literally the enemy to be liquidated. One of the uh, actual, incidentally, fle flesh and blood genetically tied plan of politicians in power today in Estonia has actually called word for word precisely for this, destroying the largest political party in this country, uh, which is currently in opposition due to the prime minister ignoring the norms of democratic procedure when you have a democratic election and the largest party supposed to form the government. But anyway, the other concept we see working overtime in the current populist revolt is a moral calculus described by Friedrich Nietzsche, which he disapprovingly calls slave morality that is above all based on resentment. In his genealogy of morals, he calls this emotion resentiment, using a French word claiming that the notion was absent in the German language, right? <laughs> well, he said, writes that, it's not true. I mean, German does have a word for resentment, but he uses the resentiment. Um, resentiment is a hateful desire for revenge, which Nietzsche uh, says is the basis of the slave revolt that, it is, that in his estimation forms the basis of Christianity. Leaving Christianity out of it, Nietzsche says that the slave, the underclass, uh, 
defines himself as good and the elite as evil. The elite, in Nietzsche's terms, the aristocrat, also defines his own actions as good, but the actions of others simply as not good or bad, without a moral implication. In the case of resentiment, a hatred arises of those who are better and defines those who are uh, better as being evil. In the populisms of the liberal democratic order, we see these, these concepts operate in tandem. Populists appealing to resentiment proclaim to speak for the common man against an imagined elite that must be destroyed. The problem with this uh, as, was, as I also mentioned before, earlier regarding the Gini coefficient, is that <clears throat> at least in all post-communist countries, there is no elite in the sense of a long existing aristocratic class. Social stratification is an inescapable aspect of meritocracy, the, working, the, <clears throat> the concept that working hard or being more capable allows you to get ahead. Yet as we see in Europe, this stratification is fairly limited as measured by the Gini index and hardly entrenched uh, since in the East, it can, this so-called lead can at most be 30 years old. There are, are alternatives where there are genuine elites, for example, based on aristocracy, or rather aristocracy based on heredity, hereditary social stratification, which is something this country actually endured for 700 years. Um, and subset ethnic or racial stratification where in the US, the color of your skin or here where one's um, undeutsch, that is to say Estonian birth, determined class for much of our history until actually the 20th century. There's also another form of elitism, <coughs> collaborationist based stratification, that is the more loyal you appear to the CPSU, the NSDAP, Fidesz, or the coterie in Donald Trump's MAGA Camarilla, the greater the odds to get ahead to get that contract and <coughs> that ambassadorial or ministerial appointment. Meritocracy has its flaws, big ones. Too often the beneficiaries of meritocracy lack a sense of the noblesse oblige that kept social peace in times of aristocracy a sense of obligation to help others that once was also a norm in the United States. Nonetheless, I would say meritocracy has led to better outcomes than hereditary aristocracy or corrupt collaborationism. Better outcomes because in meritocracy, stupidity or incompetence is neither rewarded nor given a pass as it was in aristocracies uh, and party loyalty based arrangements in authoritarian states. In meritocracy, the ones on the top, the so-called alpha males, which is the, some people claim to be around here, um, <coughs> alpha males, which is a, a rather ludicrously <coughs> inept self-characterization of the crypto or not so fascist, crypto fascist in government, are constantly plagued by the competence of others. Competition is eternal and essential, but the problem is if you have genuine competition, you might lose out which is why you have to blame the elites to avoid a meritocracy. It is this feature of illiberalism that gives me the greatest hope for its temporariness. This slide to my mind says it all. Where's the slide? Somewhere. Please put on the slide. There, I hope you can see it. I think this sort of sums up our entire situation. Well, I will read it to you. It is a picture of an airplane. And there's a guy that stands up. I mean, that is the beginning of violent protest. Yeah. Fast pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks ISIS flies a plane? To my mind, that is characterizes characterizes populism across Europe people who are not very good, try, wanting to run the show by claiming that the people who know how to do things are smug elitists. And populists of this kind that say things like this 
simplify and reduce complex societies to problems supposedly created by elites, assuming that, they're <coughs> that these are so secure, that the situation is so secure that no disaster can actually befall a society, no matter who is in charge. What can happen when incompetent populists take over and assume they know better than the people who have been doing this all this time and who have actually worked their way up in the civil service or foreign service, we see these very days before our eyes in the US administration's approach to Ukraine. And we, while we may not be affected by it too much, imagine how it feels to be Ukrainian today when you have cronies getting professional diplomats fired because there's a political agenda back at home. So I would say the same is true of any issue where competence is taken for granted. Anyone who has really dealt with disasters, be it in military planning and cyber attacks or financial disaster, know what a difficult and constant, perpetually difficult state it is to run a society and run a country. Yet the populists do not understand this. Indeed, the attitude of populists, be they Brexiteers or our own domestic ones, is summed up precisely by this cartoon, I think. I might add, just as an aside, improving my point about incompetence that a member of the party of the governing coalition wrote a letter recently to my successor um, attaching this cartoon uh, that I had tweeted saying that, that elsewhere in the world, posting a cartoon like this would result in administering the death penalty. And uh, well, the president's little chancery forwarded this correspondence to me, right? It's great. Well, anyway, that's perhaps true in North Korea, but not in a liberal democracy. This demand for capital punishment for yours truly sums up pars pro toto the picture of governance that results from the politics of resentiment, the incompetence and ignorance, the YouTube and conspiracy site mentality that feeds the autodidacticism of populists who gain power. Be it the current shenanigans of the Trump administration in Ukraine, the failures of Brexiteers for more, <clears throat> for more than three years to present any cogent plan for achieving their goals or the lies of Estonia's own non-English speaking monolingual Minister of Foreign Trade and Information Technology uh, or the Minister of Internal Affairs who rambles on about a deep state in this country. The failure of the politics of resentiment is its most outstanding and common feature. <coughs> the sheer incompetence of government governing, while it gives some temporary hope and reassurance to people less incompetent, that is the temporary nature, is not cause enough for optimism, however. Stupidity, ignorance, lack of preparation and incompetence, if left to fester in power, will degrade democracy nonetheless, as we have seen in any number of, the country, number of countries in the last half decade, and we may all be worse off for it. It is impossible to predict whether the United States, after four years of the current administration, can ever regain the prestige and moral leadership it enjoyed in the post-war as well as the post-wall period, which leaves much of the democratic world, especially smaller countries, alone to face genuine threats as well as their own domestic stupidity. So it's up to each of us in our own country to face these de demons on our own. Now, while I can offer no immediate solution, there are ways to prevent this backsliding from the ideals we shared throughout five years of, five decades of fighting totalitarian oppression. There are softer measures, but then again, the adversaries of democracy are softer too, fearing to employ those instruments of repression that allowed their predecessors as enemies of open societies to maintain their superiority through walls and secret police, et cetera. Ultimately, the weakness of authoritarians is precisely their incompetence-based resentiment. Recall that it was their failure to compete that led to the ineluctable decline of the communist, communism of the USSR. And so too with other authoritarians, if we know our history, be they Franco in France, Salazar in Portugal, or indeed the Nazis. 
Resentiment, when it wins power, is faced with the problem of actually governing, and there is no better example of the difficulty of doing so than this country today, no matter how much some psychophantic members of the media spout their Pandalossi and hosannas about the cleverness of the government's machinations in Parliament, or take seriously the infantile short-termism <coughs> of the demolition of uh, the national pension scheme. As a result, in the tradition of all real as well as wannabe authoritarians, you try to excuse your failures, which become increasingly evident, to outside forces. In Nazi Germany, and unfortunately for at least one minister in this government, it was the Jews. In the communist USSR, it was the five enemies of socialism, spring, summer, fall, winter, and international imperialism. Fidesz blames Soros, the Brexit Party and the UKIP and Brussels. The, the Brexit Party and UKIP blame Brussels. In the US, it's the deep state, meaning civil servants that believe in the rule of law. Everywhere, it's the so-called elite. And especially in competent versions, they cannot even invent their own culprits, so they borrow other people's culprits. The deep state, the Nazis' bizarre patented term cultural Bolshevism, which is strictly a Nazi term, yet we hear it on the radio all the time from certain ministers, the racism and Islamophobia copied from other countries, all here, one of the most racially homogeneous countries in Europe, uh, with nary a Muslim to be found, just strikes me as being bizarre. All of this is so well studied and documented that in social psycholo psychology, it all even has its own name, an effect. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I hope we all learn to understand in its totality, which is the tendency of small intellects to overestimate their knowledge and intelligence. And if you want to see examples, I would read any Estonian newspaper. Dunning and Kruger, a professor and his graduate student in 1999, published this article that focused on the ability of people to gauge one's relative task performance, something which they call metacognition. And they've argued that the incompetent suffer a double curse. Uh, those who perform poorly in some area are not only unskilled, but they are also unaware of the lack of their skill. And this relationship between perceived performance and actual performance, both absolute and relative to peers, is often meager. I would go so far as saying that the Dunning-Kruger effect is the core metaphor of populism of today's era, and I hope it is applied to more analyses uh, in, uh, of our current plight. So ladies and gentlemen, this incompetence is all so laughable, yet we don't laugh. Estonians especially don't laugh, but uh, you know, otherwise you'd be rolling in the aisles. But anyway, uh, we don't laugh. We are appalled, as are all who actually know something and believe in decency and the progress made by knowledge and by humanity. We share news of the latest absurdity or the repulsive sexual comments made by some criminal anointed with an advisor's position by a minister who then goes on to lie about it. The populist resentiment, <coughs> his need to destroy the other is an understandable response to the complete failure to make it on your own. Now, of course, we are offended by their behavior the white supremacist hand gestures, the appropriation of the Nazi slogan, Entgültige Lösung, by little people who find these antics and, and also themselves very clever. What we fail to recognize is how laughable it all is. It is ridiculous. They are ludicrous. We are too cultured, unfortunately, too polite to be steeped in our values of liberté, égalité, and fraternité to actually laugh. We are committed to the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. And if all men are created equal, then it's not really nice to laugh at them. But we, not they, uh, are the ones who find it uncivilized to laugh at people's stupidity, at their unlettered boorishness. For we do not want to become like them. But I think we are past Marcus Aurelius's dictum, 
The best revenge is not to become like them. We are beyond reminding ourselves of the subtle insights of authors that the populists have not even heard of, let alone read. Which is why we need to adopt at least a strategy for coping, if not overcoming the, and ultimately restoring democracy, and that is laughter. With the pomposity and preposterous self-importance stentorian ponderousness of little minds in power cannot stand, what exposes their weakness, their nakedness, is ridicule. This is, of course, best exemplified by Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Emperor's New Clothes, a tale of the ridiculousness of a stupid ruler kept in power only by the willingness of his subjects to go along with whatever what <coughs> everyone actually realizes is utter nonsense. There is no need to go along with it, none. In real life, we have the perfect example of the downfall of Nikolai Ceausescu, an authoritarian with <coughs> who also ran one of the most repressive apparatuses in history. What happened when Ceausescu, faced with increased grumbling, also 30 years ago in 1989, following the liber <coughs> liberation of Germany, Czechoslovakia, and other authoritarian countries, was that he assembled a crowd before him because they were getting restless. And he began one of his risible speeches promising the miners, they were mainly miners, a pitiful raise. So he did this, and there were about 5,000 people there, and he's way up there looking down, promising 20 leo or, or something like that. Anyway, not much. And then someone laughed. And soon others laughed. Laughter is contagious. It pierces our defenses. We cannot resist to recognize absurdity and laugh alone. And this is what happened 30 years ago. The crowd laughed at the dictator and kept laughing. He grew distraught and appealed with his ridiculous communist jargon to the crowd, comrades, comrades, calm down, comrades. But the people were not his comrades. He was simply a privileged fool with the trappings of power and a title. Ultimately, he fled, whisked out of Bucharest as a, on a Soviet helicopter. Now while while our pres <coughs> current preposterous leaders in Europe hardly deserve Ceausescu's ultimate fate, I believe laughter and ridicule is our an <coughs> antidote. Laugh at their press conferences, laugh at their statements, laugh publicly, laugh when you see them. We all know how silly their statements are, how laughable their pronouncements are. Their comical uniform, the chapeau as an alt-right brand, their dog whistle okay signs, clever only to themselves and their medieval sense of some kind of brotherhood across the West racist international, a not so secret handshake to show the world what they really think. So laugh. They are the mustachioed man in the airplane. Uh, and just like the man in the caricature, they're a joke. Now what I wanna now show you briefly, and maybe it's easier to see this than the other thing, which is a very short video of when a racist, obnoxious, pretentious person started yelling racist, pre uh, preposterous things. Oh. Thing one tonight, democracy's never been pretty, but more and more it, lately it seemed downright ugly, which may be why the video from Tucson, Arizona has captured all of our imagination this week. The city council had just formally approved putting a citizen initiative on the ballot to declare Tucson a sanctuary city. Not everyone was happy with that decision, but the right to protest is a fundamental part of democracy. Yeah. The point is, this is... 
in the face of that anti-immigration protest, the inspector for... It went viral. All over the U.S., people watched this, and he's known as the green, the, the man in the green shirt, because he did what other people failed to do when confronted by people who are obnoxious and racist and stupid. And I should add that the woman you saw in the beginning yelling was recently arrested by the police for identity theft, which gives you an idea what the people were dealing with. But the green shirt man is a meme now. Now, for a minute to be serious and say, look, laugh, but let's think of where we are. The dream, ever since of <clears throat> stirring national consciousness here some 200 years ago, when we here on this small patch of land began to understand that we too are humans and no less capable than our overlords, that the natural order of things did not mean that we were the undoid, the underclass, the primitives, that our language also was a real language. It has been, it is the struggle for to achieve liberty and equality that is the dominant motif of our history for the past two centuries. From the Alexander School, asking that we be educated in our own language, to the freedom marches in 1917 in St. Petersburg, from the War of Independence, the establishment of statehood, through the darkness of our occupation from another and yet another, through mass deportations, mass flight to the West, through the summary executions, through the false hopes of the 1960s spring, through the reawakenings in the 1980s, the singing, the hard first years when we learned the lessons of real independence, not to depend on or from anyone through the struggles of the West. It was freedom that we wanted, liberté and égalité, to be taken as a free, as free and equal with those who had fared better than we, and who, alas, still consider us less than equal occasionally, where, where the law, rule of law ends when you want a pipeline to Russia opposed only by those Easterners who are all stupid anyway and knee-jerk Russophobes. We need not be reminded today, when so many have forgotten where we were and how far we have come, how sacred freedom and democracy are, especially those <coughs> who should know what its absence means. We need to recall, especially in these days when we see among us and at the highest level of power, a forgetting, an amnesia, an amnesia of what our nation has aspired to for centuries, summoning instead the darkest forces, the meanest spirits of the nastiest parts of Europe's past. We want our speech to be free. After all, we have known it <coughs> it for too few periods in our history. We want to be able to love whom we love. We want to believe what and in what our consciences have brought us to. We need no one to tell us these things, especially when the ones telling us are unlettered and unread, boorish and primitive. We have ridden to, pow <coughs> ridden to power through hatred and resentment. The failures who run a country the way Orwell's Napoleon, the chief pig, and animal farm led his little provincial patch, and who sincerely believe and say outright, as Carl Schmidt advocated, that their goal is to destroy the opposition. The imprint of this history is too strong to erase with the boorish belching and insults that today passes for speech. We have worked too hard. We have sacrificed for too many years sweated for too many generations to allow this to happen to the efforts of all those who preceded us, who struggle for freedom and a fair chance is equal on this miraculous continent we call Europe, our home. The dream of our forefathers in the fields of the baronial manors in the gulag and on the song festival grounds, their dreams, our dreams, we won't let them take it away if we never stop laughing at them. Thank you.